So I'm Stefan Orovich, one of the partners of Space Tech Partners, and I have been involved in the development and user uptake of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service since already 15 years ago, and I'll try to give you an overview of the service. So first, description of the Copernicus EMS. Well, this service is one of the six services of um, Copernicus. And as you can see, Copernicus is both six services and six different types of satellites, uh, which, which we already have uh, eight in, in orbit. And I'd like here to make a point. Uh, our colleague, Dr. Tawashi Raporn said, uh, ESA Sentinel-1. Ah, it's operated by ESA. It was designed by ESA, but in both cases, under delegation of the, of the European Union. And uh, we, it's important to know that these satellites belong to the European Union. They don't belong to ESA. And they were funded uh, in majority by uh, European Commission budget and not by ESA. So these services and the data from these satellites is made available globally on a full free and open basis. Um, there's a new regulation that will be adopted um, late, uh, later uh, in April, uh, 28th of April is the, uh, is the date for the plenary session of the European Parliament that will adopt that regulation. It provides Copernicus with 4.8 billion euros for the next seven years. So the important thing for users to use a service or to use data from a satellite is continuity. If you know that this satellite does not necessarily have a successor, you will not invest in changing processes and in changing the way um, emergency management is performed. Uh, as I said, the data is full free and open, which means that any activation uh, of the emergency management service is provided free of charge to the requester, to the uh, user. We therefore, we have eight satellites currently in orbit, and at least two of them, Sentinel-1 radar data, and Sentinel-2 optical data are used, but they're used in combination with very high resolution satellite data that is procured um, by the service providers uh, to, in, because in some cases, the resolution of the Sentinels is not sufficient. Uh, but their data is routinely used for a certain number of applications, one of which, uh, as uh, indicated also by our UNOSAT colleagues, being uh, flood, map, flood, flood mapping. Uh, the funds um, to develop the services and to operate the satellites are de delegated by the European uh, Union, who uh, the management of the European Commission, uh, delegated to entities, which can be ESA, UMEDSAT, uh, um, industry or research centers for the actual delivery of the services. And the services are operational 24 seven every day of the year. And in particular, the emergency management service. Uh, some of the maps are released sometimes at two in the morning local time in uh, European local time <laughs> on Sundays, on Saturdays. Uh, this team has uh, no holidays, basically. Well, they have, but they, they, rot they rotate. So it's a European program, as a, a U European Union program, six services. Uh, others are, interest are interesting uh, for the area. Uh, the Marine Service will be uh, partly presented tomorrow in uh, my colleague Anne-Catherine Anne de Bien's presentation on uh, Copernicus applications for maritime um, issues. But also, I think important, the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service offers land use information and land change uh, globally. The Atmosphere Monitoring Service of offers uh, forecasts for pollutants or air quality, for instance, uh, for various pollutants, be, be they the result of, um, of wildfires, be they the result of industrial activity, of cars, etc. And the Climate Change Service offers a uh, auto, 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 autoritative uh, worldwide uh, database of uh, essential climate elements. So the EMS, it's been operational since 2012 uh, and was developed through research projects funded by the European Union. Uh, it addresses both man-made and natural disasters globally. Uh, it supports all the phases of the uh, emergency management uh, uh, chain cycle, uh, be it before the before disasters, in order to try and uh, foresee what their potential consequences could be. Uh, so basically, disaster risk reduction, 
emergency management, facilitating the response, and reconstruction also. They address all kinds of disasters, be they uh, tsunamis, uh, industrial accidents, volcanic eruptions, landslides, uh, fires, uh, humanitarian crises, hurricanes, earthquakes, etc. They are complementary to national and international, like those of UNICEF, um, these services. They are supported and coordinated, uh, at least from an operational point of view, by the European um, Emergency Response and Coordination Center here in Brussels. Uh, and they are, the lead is with um, DG DEFIS, the Directorate General for Defense Industry and Space, but the Joint Research Center of the European Commission does the technical coordination, and DG ECHO, the Directorate General for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management, is also playing an important role as kind of the dispatcher of the service. It has two main components, an on-demand mapping component and an early warning component, which, will, which I will present in more details. The components. So first, on-demand mapping services that can be separated into two sub-components. One is rapid mapping, which provides geospatial information, so not only maps, but actually vector data that can be ingested into geographical information systems. Highly st standardized pro uh, products uh, in order to make the production fast uh, and delivered in a matter of hours or, or days. And in fact, the main, the main driver of the timeliness is the availability of usable satellite pictures. Because if you're, if you're trying to observe a phenomenon that can only be seen in optical data and the area is cloudy, by definition, you have to wait until you get a cloudless image before you can uh, actually do the processing and extract the information from the satellite imagery. The, while the risk and recovery is done during normal working hours, um, it does, um, and it's reserved for situations that do not require a really rapid, rapid response. And they have both standardized and tailor-made products uh, in two different uh, categories. And here you're talking about deliveries uh, within uh, weeks or months, depending on what needs to be done. So what, the rapid mapping, how does it work? It can be triggered only, and I'll come back to it, by authorized users. The requests are analyzed by the uh, Emergency Response and Coordination Center in Brussels. And if all the criteria are met, they lead to an activation. The maps, the geospatial layers are derived by service providers. So mostly private sector that have uh, succeeded in tenders and they produce these uh, products. They are put, posted on, on, a, uh, a, uh, on a server. They're available also on a web mapping service. Uh, so that's the general the way it works. The timeliness. The timeliness is, as you can see on this chart, satellite tasking when the satellite that we are using uh, in this case can be, can be tasked uh, because some satellites like uh, Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2, they just do uh, carpet mapping or carpet acquisition. They don't need to be tasked uh, while uh, very high resolution satellites may need to be tasked. Then the time to receive the images once they have been acquired and that, as you can see, the, the, the production of the maps themselves is really uh, very, very rapid. So you can see here the various uh, delivery times. Uh, but really, the thing to understand is most, the timeliness is mostly dependent, again, from the, uh, from the um, time that it takes to get an image, uh, often as a joke you hear users saying well, their main requirement for satellites for emergency man management is we need, we need cloud, cloudless weather because that's a very strong driver. We've had, the service has had 504 application um, activations to date. So that's quite, quite a lot, as you can see. Uh, second subcomponent, risk and recovery. Risk and recovery is mostly used for disaster risk reduction and also for post-disaster mapping for reconstruction purposes in particular to, to monitor the situation. Um, there, no constraint for the time of delivery. 
the service is very much customized and uh, you're talking about uh, again weeks weeks and months before and it's very dependent on the in integration of what we call ancillary layers to give you an example if you want to estimate uh, which are the areas that could be flooded by a uh, storm surge or by a uh, or by a flood? You need to have a very good uh, digital uh, terrain model, uh, which sometimes is only is, is the, either does not exist or is owned by local authorities. So there, there is a very strong co collaboration between the requesting organization and the um, the producers of the maps, and they. Over and above the geospatial data, they also produce detailed reports uh, in order to give a good overview of what is, uh, what is the result of the, uh, of the analysis. And the service por portfolio, as you can see, covers many different types of products. There is a standard portfolio, and that is, uh, it's, this gives you the list. So it's already quite, quite a number of standard products. And of course, standard products can be delivered in a quicker fashion than uh, what we call flex products. Uh, flex products, much many, many more different cases and many more different types of uh, assessments of uh, risk, hazard, vulnerability, et cetera, et cetera, and um, therefore uh, longer lead times for the delivery. So uh, there have been less activations of this um, of this service, only 87 to date, partly because of a lack of awareness of uh, potential users of the existence of that service. But again, it's it's free of, of charge and uh, can easily be uh, activated. Uh, what about the use of the ser these services in ASEAN? Well, as you can see, there's been quite a number of activations in uh, the in the region some countries are either not affected or or, or you know those, those have not been affected by disasters have obviously not resorted to the to the service but just to say that uh, there has been quite a quite an, an, a number already and uh, i believe that the the, the european commission and the uh, producers of the maps are very happy to be uh, uh, really assist, assisting uh, populations and emergency management operators uh, after after disasters occur. This is a view for 2020, and you can see here uh, the subset of activations for the region. Uh, very often, as said by colleagues from UNOSAT, uh, these activations are coordinated with uh, other organizations. So when there's a lot of areas of interest, so many different areas need to be mapped, uh, then we usually, there's usually a, a distribution uh, of area of interest so that we can do the mapping in a faster way and of course not duplicate the work between Euro European Union uh, products and uh, international uh, colleagues. Uh, Examples, a few examples of rapid mapping products. So the, serv the service was activated after the, uh, uh, the earthquake and tsunami in Palu. Right. Uh, it was activated also uh, after the uh, tsunami in Indonesia following the uh, Anak Krakatau um, volcanic eruption. It was activated after Typhoon Manghut in Northern Philippines. It was activated after floods in Kanto, Vietnam, uh, more technical in-depth analysis were also performed after the, um, um, an earthquake in Sulawesi in Indonesia. How to trigger the service? The service has to be triggered by an authorized user. This authorized user usually fills in what we call a service request form uh, that indicates why the acquisition is necessary uh, what's the area of interest and what are the products that are uh, required? Because it can be what they call delineation maps. So what's the extent of the flood? Uh, or what's the uh, extent of the uh, wildfire burn scar? But it, it can also be reference maps for areas where recent maps are not available. Or it can also be grading maps that basically describe the impact of the disaster, how many 
uh, buildings were destroyed, housings, how, what's, the, what's the population, the number of people affected, what is the land use of the land affected, is it agricultural area, is it just uh, plains, so lots of details there. And for activating when you're not a member of the European Union, the best solution is to go through the uh, EU delegation where um, policy uh, officers um, will assist uh, users to, uh, to activate the service. But in case of uh, need, uh, service request forms can also be sent directly to uh, the Emergency uh, Response and Coordination Center Then will then yield back with the EU delegation in order to assess uh, the activation request. Over and above these rapid mapping services for early warning, uh, there are also uh, three services, three products, one for fires, one for floods, and one for drought. Uh, for floods, for floods, uh, it's a global service that basically based on meteorological information, on earth observation of, uh, informations about, for instance, soil moisture, because floods will obviously be stronger if the soil is already quite uh, damp. Uh, so it combines all of this information. And uh, since recently, it has an interesting product that was inter still experimental, um, not yet fully operational, but the product is already in the portal. That is the automatic extraction of flood, flooded areas systematically from the entire catalog of um, Sentinel-1 radar uh, activations. And it's a very useful uh, service because, well, A, it obviously gives warnings, um, but it also is used to sometimes pre-task satellites. When you, know the, when you know that a flood is highly probable, well, then you can pre-task um, the acquisition of VHR, of very high resolution uh, imagery, um, which obviously makes the delivery of rapid mapping quicker. Here's a few examples from the region. It also produces um, um, reports. And for instance, in Vietnam, the uh, uh, flooding events of last October were very accurately predicted by uh, this GLOFAS. Uh, there's also the GWIS. The GWIS is the Global Wildfire Information System. And this is a cooperation between the European Commission through the Copernicus Program the Group on Earth Observation, and NASA. It provides fire danger forecasts based again on meteorological data, the, the temperature, the winds, uh, but also on the type of land cover. And this is a very, this is from today. This is today, the risk, the risk of fires for today uh, and overlaid on that information, you can see the active fires as um, derived from um, satellite acquisitions um, in the past in the past 24 hours but you can also look over the past seven days or across any given uh, period of time it produces also reports so you have analytical reports on the situation of a particular country um, what's the size of the burned areas in a given year compared to the average etc cetera, etc cetera, or by region finally there's a global drought observation uh, system which provides um, warnings on upcoming upcoming droughts so it's both the monitoring of the drafts but also the forecasting based again on meteorological information um, and on the on our meteorological forecasts and it, it goes all the way to a uh, seasonal uh, time scales and it, it evaluates also the um, likely impact the severity of the uh, likely impact this is an example for, uh, that was, uh, of the information that was displayed before the uh, drought of August 2020 uh, in the region. And the uh, color codes obviously indicate the level of severity, red being the most severe uh, impact. And it includes, of course, a, a dynamic evaluation of the risk uh, over time. And there are reports for the most severe droughts uh, the, the forecast of most severe drafts that are produced on a, on a regular basis. 
International cooperation uh, is an essential dimension. As uh, said earlier by colleagues, uh, EMS collaborates with United Nations uh, institutions with a national uh, emergency response or national uh, satellite um, mapping uh, organizations. Collaborates also very um, closely with the International Char Charter for Space and Major Disasters. Uh, and there I'd like to make a, a point. There's a big difference between the Charter that many uh, colleagues have uh, spoken about in earlier presentations and Copernicus EMS. Copernicus EMS has a very strict service level agreement with the producers, the uh, private sector producers of the uh, products. So if they don't deliver in time and on quality, they don't get paid or they get penalties, uh, which is a major difference. And there's also a very sophisticated uh, quality control and ex post uh, evaluation of the products. So we ensure, uh, the commission ensures that the, uh, that is not just best efforts. I mean, there is a validation contract where sometimes uh, we, uh, drone surveys are performed or on-site surveys are performed in order to verify the accuracy of the information that was developed, that was presented to, uh, to the users. Where to find information? There's quite a lot on the emergency.copernicus.eu um, website. Uh, the service also has a um, uh, social media Twitter account on which they publish maps automatically, on which they publish information about the service, et cetera, et cetera. And I encourage you to follow uh, these resources. The products can be uh, accessed. And there's actually a new, rather new, a few months old only, um, web-based uh, system where you can overlay directly the layers, et cetera, uh, on a web mapping service that is quite useful rather than a PDF. Um, and obviously, uh, it is easier to use than to just import the uh, vector data into an, an, a geographical information uh, system. Um, and that's an example of that online visualization service in which you can really see on a map uh, the, the actual product and um, monitor the information. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm sorry that I have to, uh, I had to maybe run a bit quickly on a few things, but I'm at your disposal together with the other presenters to answer any questions that you would have. Thank you for your attention.